his neonatal period fellowship at the UC at UCSD. Anu, thank you so much for uh, joining us today and for talking about principles of research in neonatal hemodynamics, for which you are already well renowned. Thank you, thank you very much. Take it away. Thanks, Benny, and um, thank you guys for organizing this meeting. Do you guys hear me okay? No issues? Yeah? yeah. Okay. And you see my slides fine, right? Yeah, all good. Okay. Um, great. That was a great talk, Reagan, by the way, too. Definitely have some questions uh, for you for the Q&A, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, so one thing just a little bit different on this talk, then I know the agenda was to talk about um, the principles and pitfalls of research, both lab and clinical. My disclaimer is I'm not a, a lab researcher. Um, you know, we have great mentors like Patrick that have done echoes on mice, et cetera. So maybe I'll leave some of those people, um, questions for people wanting to do uh, lab-based research or hemodynamic research, you know, in animal models, et cetera, for that. So I will share mostly my experience with doing clinical research, but more importantly than my own experience, really the sort of principles on, on how to conduct clinical research that apply to all research, but specifically we'll, we'll delve into uh, hemodynamics. And I'll mostly focus on echo, but there obviously are lots of other areas of hemodynamic research, particularly things like NEARS. And so I'll touch on those as well when we do some of the clinical examples um, uh, towards the end of this uh, talk. So getting right into it, um, there's a few parameters I wanted to highlight when you are designing or even thinking about doing a clinical research project. So there's a few sort of um, key points that I'll go through in these first couple slides. And so the first big one is you know, really specifying your kind of experimental and comparison regimen. So it's sort of that who, what, where, and why type of thing that we always do when we're um, trying to solve a problem. But with, with echo research, it is important to understand um, as we're choosing things to sort of apply these principles. So when we talk about who, it's, it's critical that when you're doing your literature review or you're trying to answer a question, something as simple as you know, treating a PD or not, understand your population. Um, obviously, the more preterm infant is going to be a very different population with a different incidence and outcome than a moderate or late preterm, or if you're doing a term population. And even as a fellow or junior faculty, sometimes you need to think about, well, what population can I approach? Which population can I study due to competing um, projects, availability of patients in your institution? Those are things that might frame that initial project that you're looking at. Um, and then the what, and, and to be honest, I was, a, uh, I was guilty of this as well. And I see, still see this in a number of hemodynamic papers is that it turns into this big fishing expedition, right? We, we see 20 or 30 echo parameters, which sound great, but really when you're designing a study, you should have one key primary outcome and only a few, maybe three to four secondary outcomes. So if you're interested in the left heart and you're looking at cardiac output, make that your primary outcome. And then you could have other measures of LV function around that as secondary outcomes. You could have lots or even an unlimited, and I hate to say that, but, but technically exploratory outcomes can be there. And you can put those in, whether it's 10 to 20 or 30 of these to look for future hypothesis generating projects. Typically early on in your career as a fellow or a junior attending, you're not looking to do a large multi-center trial. You're trying to just um, really generate good preliminary data. And so it's okay to have multiple outcomes, but really frame it in, in terms of what is your first primary outcome and then your secondary. And this gets, uh, it's becoming more and more important when we go to publish papers and write these up, since many journals are not looking to accept studies that have um, you know, 20 to 30 outcomes that are sort of listed there. Um, then the next piece of when, we know hemodynamics change, transitional physiology, right? That's a big buzzword when we're um, conducting studies or even assessing patients, right? A large bidirectional PDA at 30 minutes is very different than at 30, uh, than three days of life. So you need to have time points. When are you gonna perform these assessments? If it's an echocardiogram, pick a narrow window, ideally within hours of life. Don't just say, I'll do an echo on day one or day three. Um, you need to hone it in. And when I, when I say a window, you need to put in, you know, is it plus or minus two or three hours on each end? So you're trying to balance the availability um, I know many of you, and I remember doing this early on in my fellowship, we, we would do serial timed echoes every six to 12 hours and you know, coming in in the middle of the night, uh, you wanna be able to balance your own sort of lifestyle to, to do these echoes, but something that physiologically makes sense so that an echo in the first six hours is different than even at 24 hours of life when you're assessing several measures. So 
Uh, timing is very critical when you're designing your study. Uh, the where is less um, important for this type of discussion, but you know, keep in mind that um, transitional physiology begins at birth. Um, there are echo studies and mirror studies in the delivery room. Um, I'll, I'll mention a few of those errors as well as in the NICU. Um, even when I, I was doing my first project as a fellow, I was looking at that transitional physiology of infants and diabetic mothers. Most of those babies were upstairs with their mothers. So timing when those babies were being moved um, from place to place is important. And that goes into, again, the feasibility of these approaches. Are you comfortable doing um, an echocardiogram at the bedside of a parent? Do you, or, or do you wanna just do studies in babies that are in the NICU? It just depends on what it is that you're looking to study. But, but really, as you're framing your question, going through these initial uh, thought processes are, are critical and sort of writing these all out um, as you're designing it. Um, this other big one about maintaining blindness, uh, you know, isn't super relevant for most echo projects. Remember, if you're getting very fancy and you're going to design an echo or NEARS guided intervention, of course, you're not blinded. That is an intervention acting on it. Um, but I will say most echo assessments are designed to be just data collection and data gathering. And so in that sense, it is important to make sure you're blinded, um, especially to sort of uh, downstream. So if you're looking at echo um, uh, study and you are the person measuring the babies um, in a milrinone, so then if they'll study, or you're looking at an inotrope, you need to be careful that you're not the one um, aware of the assigned intervention. Ideally with these drug trials, they should be blinded. Um, but if you aren't, if it's a study where you're aware of the clinical situation, it's important that you find someone who can be blinded that is, that is doing these echoes. And um, for those of us that have done a lot of echoes, we clearly are, are sort of taking into the gestalt of the patient and, and integrating this data. But when we're doing measurements, it's important for us to understand that a blinded echo has a very different profile when it's being analyzed um, that's independent of what the clinical situation is. And, and, and we can talk about more of that if, if that's confusing in the Q&A. Um, blinding does become important when uh, the echo is the primary outcome or a measure of, of that is the primary outcome that it's not being influenced um, by what arm or what sort of clinical situation that baby was in. So um, some of these new um, studies are also looking at being able to test blindness or not. I think that's sort of um, irrelevant, but you will see that come up in papers that, you know, did you prove that the blind was really there? But at the end of the day, even if the clinicians were able to guess, it doesn't really mean they were unblinded or they just guessed correctly. And so that's sort of a debatable thing, but it is just important for you to know that it, that is out there. Then the next sort of big point is looking at uh, how to, what to do about monitoring uh, and imp improving compliance. So how do you ensure that everything's being done appropriately? Um, so if you're supervising a study, let, let's say you're using um, you know, research stenographers as some places do, Ensure that they're able to you know, uh, perform the echoes in a, in a timely way according to your protocol and that you're able to audit that and uh, supervise it. If it's um, you yourself, just ensuring that um, you have that time and availability to do so. For monitoring studies, like say for instance, NEARS, um, oftentimes it's not you placing the NEARS. Um, you may have it initially placed by some clinical staff and then they're the ones sort of assessing it. So how do you obtain sort of buy-in and check? So, uh, NEARS is a big one where you have to continually check the probe, you know, maybe every three to six hours to ensure that there's good contact, it's not being moved, you're getting a good reading. Um, these are things where, you know, working with your nursing staff, having little goodies like chocolates or going around and educating them, holding informal meetings. Those work really well to get staff buy-in. Um, and this could be very true uh, even for a QI project as well. But in, if you have a time narrow window where you're uh, needing close monitoring, it's important that uh, you're able to get good staff buy-in for them as well. And then for echocardiograms, I think, uh, you know, um, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but, you know, echocardiogram for studies um, is, is really different than if you're just learning how to do echo. So for instance, you need to have um, focused limited scans if you're, if you're doing this on very unstable or sick babies, particularly in the first few hours of life. These are babies that multiple things are happening. We do not want to destabilize infants. So um, you may need to sort of either do a quick scan if you need to rule out congenital heart disease, but then moving into the measures you need. And then maybe at a later time point, if you need to get other uh, measures that are less relevant, you can go back and do those as well. Anormothermia is a big one as you're learning to do echoes, particularly in small babies, to, to, to use the portholes and that sort of thing. But you don't want the echo 
to be a, a risk factor. And this gets into things even when you're obtaining consents and, and designing your IV protocol. There have been a number of studies saying that echoes aren't destabilizing if done properly. And so you really want to be able to ensure that you're doing it in a time-limited fashion and, and working with the clinical staff. So I think the last bullet is a good one. You know, for me, I definitely learned a lot at echocardiography with doing research, but that's probably not the way to do it. You really should be um, skilled enough to perform screening echocardiography and getting your in initial measures. And then when you're doing your study, that's really just picking a few parameters that you're, you're trying to hone in and fine tune it, but don't make that the process for learning or you'll miss measures that you were supposed to get. There's a lot of things that sort of happen um, by repetition and knowing your sort of order of doing things. And, and the study is not, shouldn't be your first uh, sort of foray uh, into learning echo. The other uh, big thing is to look at, at a system when you're doing a new study is to set up a process for avoiding and, and documenting contamination and co-intervention. So what, particularly for hemodynamic trials, we need to be careful that we avoid things like crossover. You know, we know this is true in, in the PDA trials where a number of babies get um, the intervention group and don't stand on placebo. So they get treated for their ductus, for instance. But um, and this is important if you're studying something that is available outside of the trial. So it's not a new drug or new therapy. You have to make sure that you have good buy-in from your you know, clinicians, even the parents when they're, um, they're hearing about your study. How can they avoid getting the, the intervention? Is there, are there alternatives to sort of provide this support and therapy that they don't have to get the intervention um, medicine? Uh, if you're conducting an unblinded tri uh, trial, like um, if you're looking at pulmonary hypertension, for instance, you need to ensure that other inter additional interventions aren't being applied more frequently to one group uh, or the other that might affect your primary outcome event. And so you need to maybe create consensus protocols. And I'll talk about this in a couple uh, case examples when we look at some of these studies. But you might have to add these additional protocols that are, are part of the trial saying, look, if this patient's enrolled, no matter what the group, this is how you're going to treat hypertension. This is how you're going to treat pulmonary hypertension outside of um, the intervention to ensure that these are all occurring at the same frequency. You're not over treating one group or the other. So those are some sort of guiding principles. Um, and again, I'll show you some studies, pretty, pretty good robust studies, not, not, not ones I'm really going to get too critical about but showing you how they're sort of um, moving from the idea of designing a study and then um, applying it into an RCT. So the first one I'll use is just an example of a study. We did a small cohort study. This was looking at neural monitoring um, in the delivery room. So I was trying to pick an example that was a little bit different than um, what many people are used to, but we looked at uh, you know, essentially monitoring NEARS uh, in the delivery room to see if we could predict intraventricular hemorrhage or death in the first 72 hours of life. And again, um, this is a cohort study. So cohort studies are designed to sort of be hypothesis generating and collecting some baseline data. So they'll be very different than when we design an RCT where we have a, you know, a setup for a PCOT question. And so I'm not going to get into the details of this study other than it was a NEARS study designed to look at um, cutoff values to predict IVH or death. And so I'm just showing you sort of one pictorial graph here. This is um, the babies who developed severe IVH or death you, here in yellow, had a lower um, nears value in the first 10 minutes of life compared to the babies who did not develop severe IVH. And when we looked at sort of a cutoff point, um, if you had a nears value of above 66 at seven minutes or greater, um, the sensitivity and specificity for not having severe IVH or death was 88 and 86 percent. So this is an example of a cohort study designed to create some hypothesis generating intervention that then could be used for a potential intervention study. And then when you move into an intervention study, like this study, the cause got three trial, you're now applying NEARS and using it as an intervention in, in babies. So this is a study that we're, we're, we're not conducting. This is actually um, being run out of Europe and it's called the cause got three trial. And it's the same exact core babies under 32 weeks of age. And this group's done a lot of fantastic work on their own using many different NEARS devices and, and using um, a NEARS cutoffs that they've developed does providing NEARS in the delivery room along with um, normal oxygen titration uh, during resuscitation, reduce brain injury in the NICU compared to their control group of just using normal ox oximetry monitoring. And so now you're, you have this in a carefully crafted PICO question where you define the population, you define the intervention, 
And it's going to be very clear when I compare this study to others that the, the intervention is very clearly defined and reproducible and, and applicable um, to sort of a control group and then a clear outcome with the time period uh, as to when you're assessing the outcome. So in this cause got three trial, they have a very clear way of applying the intervention, although you might think this flow chart's a little convoluted, but essentially if the baby is randomized to getting mirrors added to the resuscitation, you can see here that they normally just apply SATs, which um, uh, we all use to guide the initial resuscitation. And then if the sat oxygen saturations are in the correct field, then they jump to NEARS um, guidelines to use uh, if the baby's above the 10th um, or less than the 10th percentile, they adjust the oxygenation as well as the um, uh, escalating the resuscitation. So uh, this is a, an example of a clear intervention that can be applied based on some original cohort data um, that could be reproducible. And then that, we don't have the data for the study because the study, I think, literally just finished um, and they're supposed to present some of the results in the next few months. But if this is successful, we have some data that then we can use. Uh, sort of contrasting that, this is the um, another near study called the Safe Boost 3 trial. Uh, again, a study that's nearing completion as well, looking at babies less than 28 weeks. And again, their intervention sounds similar. It's NEARS guided management compared to usual care, which would be without NEARS, again, to reduce death or severe brain injury. And you know, again, I'm not trying to be critical about this study, but when you're looking at the intervention compared to the one I just showed you use, uh, using NEARS in the delivery room, this is the guideline for uh, applying NEARS in the NICU. And you can see here that if the NEARS level is out of range, meaning it's below 55 or above 85, you have the whole host of these interventions that you can do. And it's designed in this quote pragmatic, which it's a loosely used term that a lot of clinical trialists use to say, oh, you, we just wanted to make it easy for people to do any number one of these interventions. But there's no real sort of stepwise approach in terms of how to apply this intervention. And so the challenge will be if this trial, and it sure maybe will, shows benefit with NEARS, then we sort of then have to go back and say, well, which of these things are we going to apply more or less frequently um, in terms of our own practice? And I'm not going to sort of read through all of these with you, but you could see some of these are, are simply just oxygen focused, but it can get as detailed as getting into treating the PDA, which you, know, you could argue, well, what are the criteria for hemodynamic significance? looking at blood gas values, um, giving blood transfusions, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just something for us to um, sort of look at. Okay, now jumping to ECHO, I'll just give a couple more examples before I wrap up here. This is another example of a good cohort study, again, data collection. And so this was a very classic uh, study where it really brought this parameter known as SVC flow uh, to the limelight many, many years ago by Martin Gluckow and Nick Evans. And they did this nice cohort study, looked at 120 babies who were preterm under 30 weeks, and they did echoes um, serially every like 5, 12, 24 hours, and developed these nice sort of normative data showing that babies who had low secretive vena cava flow, and this was um, uh, looking at sort of the age-specific values of less than um, 30 in the first six hours, and then all the way up to less than 45, um, at 40 plus hours of life, characterizing these babies at higher risk of intraventricular hemorrhage. And so using this cohort data, they then developed a, a randomized controlled trial, looking at an intervention to test this. And they had even done some original pilot work, looking at sort of dose escalation study of, of looking at Milner known infusions. And so this is an example of, again, of a PCOT question Picking your population in premature infants less than 30 weeks, and they all have to be less than six hours old, looking at a middle known infusion, and you can see the dose there compared to a placebo. And, they, and again, this is a nice way to do it. Uh, anytime you have a drug study to be able to have a placebo group so you can maintain the blind. And then looking at the incidence of low flow uh, in the first 24 hours of life, you can see here they did several echoes in the first 24 hours, including one at 48 hours of life. And in this study, they also did a nice job of trying to look at co-interventions, which you could argue could have even muddied the water here, but they really try to standardize how these babies were treated outside of just the melanin infusion. So even though that was blinded, they wanted to standardize how often you gave normal saline boluses, that it was similar, uh, treating the ductus, um, which was quite frequent in this era of time. Um, they just used a simple diameter rule. So you, you can see uh, in the results, a number of these babies were treated. 
and uh, the use of, um, of dopamine was prescribed because at that time, um, echo wasn't really available. So presser use was really just guided by a low blood pressure, not by echo. And so, and they sort of explain that rationale here in the low bullet, but they had a clear guideline as to how dopamine was to be used at what parameter and how it was increased. Um, and so uh, for this time period, this was a, a really appropriate and, and a good way of looking at co-intervention use um, in their trial. And if you don't know the results of this trial, essentially they didn't find any uh, uh, significant difference in, in any of their major hemodynamic parameters. Um, heart rate was higher, but, but, but what was most concerning is babies actually trended to need more inotrope in the Milrona group compared to the placebo group. Um, and you can see some of the other things, as I alluded to earlier, a higher rate of treatment with insulin, um, et cetera, that were trends higher in the other group, but really no differences in any of their clinical outcomes. But again, an example of how to take a cohort study and then move it into a randomized control trial. All right. And then my, so the last slide, just to sort of recap that when you're looking at designing your research questions, oops, I think I lost my last one. Um, it's to really try to be as specific as possible about your question. And, and then ideally starting with a cohort study is always the easiest and most um, feasible thing to do early on in your career, unless you have a lot of out, outside external funding to sort of cover, uh, you know, data monitoring, a clinical coordinating center, et cetera. Doing cohort studies are great ways to sort of start off your career and then generate some good data that can be then used for a larger RCT. Um, trying to maintain blinding, particularly for when you're performing these scans, um, try not to be involved in the clinical care for that. Again, the caveat is unless it's an echo or nearest guided intervention um, is really important. And that'll be important when you write up your paper or even apply for grants. And then try and engage staff when possible is really important. And this goes even when, um, you know, even when Reagan sought to try to build up your own program, you want to have good buy-in from staff. If you're going in there and scanning these babies and the nurses don't want you there, that's the end of it. Um, but, but getting them engaged to help you is really going to contribute to the success of your study. And then thinking ahead about potential contamination and co-interventions. How will people use these results? What are people going to be doing outside of the study um, that could impact your results? And then the last thing, and I, it really should be the most important thing, is make sure you're conducting research that you enjoy. It should be a question that you truly want to do, not somebody else's sort of idea of things. But if you're going to stay post-call or you're going to be echoing these kids in the middle of the night, make it a question that you're really passionate about. Um, I think that's when you really start to enjoy conducting research. I know for me, this was the driving force for why I got into moving for just doing clinical care and neonatology, but because you enjoy answering these questions. So um, hopefully I gave you a quick overview in 10 minutes um, and I'll hang out for the questions afterwards. Thanks. Thank you so much, Luke. That was fantastic.